whether they agree or not. So I would say that there are undoubtedly people, I would say, on both sides of the argument who are going to and are misinterpreting what I'm saying. But I don't I don't think that that invalidates what I'm doing because the majority of people don't seem to be responsible. Okay, so for the first as you can see, all they are contributing to the discussion right there is white yeah, well, no, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not trying to correct your remembrance, yeah. but the second one was more structural. Yeah, well, the second one I felt like, yeah, I think it was the second one where I felt like you were speaking, like, out of emotions here and, like, and you were talking about, uh, you were stating a lot of um, literature, or lack thereof, or, or um, studies, or lack thereof, in, in speaking on, on, for example, the impact that a, um, the lack of diversity has on a corporation, for example, in the regards to many And so, I felt like... Like, well, we don't want to necessarily make so like the case that we want to increase diversity to remove prejudice. Okay, but the thing is, is that one thing I can say is that I feel like there's a lot of people who don't I never introduced race into this dialogue. And I'm not treating you like a black woman. I'm treating you like a human being. And so to introduce race into the dialogue, I think I don't think I don't think it's helpful. I don't think it's helpful for what you're after. And that's partly why I'm doing this. I think that our society has become so obsessed with group identity that we're pushing in a counterproductive direction. Okay, so I think that I disagree with that. Yeah, fair because, enough. You because because I bring my lived experience into everything that I do yeah. as a black woman. Yeah. Um, the 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 way that I view this world, um, the oppression that I that I feel, yeah. and the way that I operate and maneuver is very much as a black woman. And yeah. I've made, I, I was racialized. I've been made aware of my race in a lot of ways. Right? This is Are you a student? Yeah. No. Oh. Um, just curious. Yeah. I just I just like to follow. Yeah. My and so, yeah, and so for me, I think it's, it's important to acknowledge your circle of competence. Yeah. And, and so to speak on things in such a sterile way, to discredit it, what do you it's think, not what an do you argument think, what do you for think me. The, the, the oppression, they need to talk about it. No, definitely about not. Oppression. Definitely not discrediting it. But I think that, and I'm glad that you're here, and I think that talking about oppression is just exactly what we need. What so, we don't need is failure to talk about oppression. Okay, so what's your main argument? Is your main argument that the legislation needs to be clearer, or is it the fact that they are doing this, um, in, they're criminalizing people that don't, that they're potentially going to criminalize people that don't um, have the right intent? Word. 
don't, don't have speak intent. the right word. That's my, my problem. They're going to criminalize not speaking the correct word. And we're not going there. I'm not going there. I can tell you that. That's not a good thing. Okay. And the fact that it is, the fact that it happens to arise out of this particular issue, yeah. you know, the transgender issue, it has to arise somewhere. But I think that the principle that I'm discussing transcends any of the localized elements of its argument. Okay, so I feel like that is a valid argument. Yeah. Where it's like, um, I feel like talking, um, making sure that the legislation is clear in, in defining what is hate speech. And Actually, I just assumed we got rid of the whole hate speech thing. Because I think it's unbelievably dangerous to drive people who hate underground and not let them talk. And it's partly because you don't know where they are. Okay. You don't know what they're doing and you can't refute them. Okay, but, so I think where I draw the most issues, like, I was like, okay, the core of your of your argument makes sense. I can kind of understand it. Okay. But where you draw that line, I don't understand. Like, yeah. the example you Look, use, I'm not using one. gender that's and pronouns. Like, I just don't get it. Yeah. At all. Oh. Well, I can tell you a bunch of things about that briefly. I'm going to just stick to the one thing for now. Okay. I think that we are in danger of crossing a very dangerous legislative line. There are reasonable restrictions that can be placed on what people can say, can't say. But you cannot force people to mouth words. It's not good. And the, seriously, the transgender issue, there's another issue associated with that. The issue is that we don't understand the biological or cultural foundations of human sexuality well enough in any sense of the word to bring premature closure to the discussion. And we are actually doing that. So, so the, in, in that argument, I don't think... I don't... It doesn't hold much validity to me because... For a person that is in an oppressed community or that yep. feels oppressed, right? Yeah. If they're asking for... So, to that answer, I said, to what end? So, so, so to what end? So, at the what end you, of this... Yeah, yeah, that's, so that's the question. Right, that's but, the question. but so it's like at the end of all this research... Yeah. Um, I'm not... And you, and, and you conclude whatever you need to conclude in order to rationalize it... Well, these, I'm, I'm like being, these people are still in the same okay. reality. They're I'm being asked. The same. I understand that. I understand that. But yeah. I do not believe that the way forward for those communities is down that path. It's not a path that's going to be good for anyone. And so this is where I come back to this framework of like yep. of Look, operating I could be from wrong. a specific place, right? It's yes. like so you as a person, as this person that has so much privilege and 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 has never really had to internalize oppression the way that an oppressed community has. Well, How you don't you know speak? much about my background, so I wouldn't make presumptions. Okay, like but I'm saying the way that an oppressed community has. So, with we live in a white supremacist society, that's just... No, nope, don't buy it. We don't live in a white wow. supremacist okay. society. Okay. okay. No, uh, yeah, look, okay. if you can think this is a white argument? supremacist can society, you should read some history. Can I just finish yeah, my... Sure. Can I just finish my argument? So... This is my argument, and then this is probably where where the, the disagreement occurs. Yeah. But so I feel like, as that person, you can't speak for a community that has already organized and spoken about what they need in order to... Why should I assume that the people who are speaking for that community are valid representatives of the community? Merely because they put themselves forward as that? We have a democracy so that people can elect representatives that have credibility. Anybody can stand up and say, I'm representing Community X. Okay. That doesn't give them legitimacy apart from the integrity of their argument. So, so I'm not convinced at all that the people who are speaking out on behalf of X community are legitimate representatives of those communities. Just because they happen to belong. Like, I'm not a legitimate representative of white men. Yeah. I'm just me. Yeah. Now, I also happen to be white since we have to have that discussion. Yeah. But that doesn't make me a representative of white people. Yeah. Or it does. If it does, it does. It's such a staggering, horrific way. Yeah. No, but it doesn't. I know you're a I know who you are, Jordan Peterson. You did a phenomenal job of articulating your arguments, by the way. Hey, so, 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 keep it up. I was wrong. Keep the girls out. Keep the women out of the I'll follow this. At this yeah, time. well. I know right on it. Yeah. I'm a racial realist, yeah. okay? Uh, this is real. Yeah. Oh, okay, another question? Yes. Uh, thank you for such uh, an awesome and brutal 
<laughs> I hear a lot of echoes of Ebola in what you're saying. Um, I want to drag you back to the alt right. Oh yes, the alt right. Um, yes. One of the core, and I think it's one of the most avant-garde political movements we have right now. And at the core of the alt right is the belief in ethnic nationalism, but not the sort of oppositional nationalism that we all know. It's more of a Frank Salter, Verdugan universal nationalism. Do you think this core belief of the alt right is flawed? Is it laudable? Is it reprehensible? Or it's incomplete. It's incomplete. I mean, it's identification with the Father. And that's necessary. But the purpose of identification with the Father is to become the Son. Right? And I mean that in all of its symbolic manifestation. And the problem with nationalism is that it forgets that. It forgets that the purpose of the nation is to give rise to the individual. And so, and what's happened now, because our identities have become fragmented, is that there's a call to reconstitute the Father. And that's, and that's at the core of the alt-right thinking. Well, that's the benevolent part of the alt-right. I mean, there's a downside, there's a negative side to everything. I mean, I, one of the things that's quite disturbing about the alt-right is its pro continual proclivity to degenerate into anti-Semitism. And I see that in the comments, for example, on my videos com continually. So, it's oversimplified. And there's, a, there's, a there's also no true recognition, or not sufficient recognition, that the state is also a pathological monster. And the alt-right should understand that, because, of course, that's what the left continually claims, right? The state is a pathological monster. Well, they're trying to produce, sorry, the, the left is trying to produce, I got that wrong. It's the basis of the alt-right's criticism of the left. The alt-right says the left is trying, always trying to expand the dominion of the state, and the state is a pathological monster. Yet, what we should do is become nationalists. It's like, sorry, guys, there's a bit of a paradox there. And, uh, well, so... So that's basically what I would say about that. It's not surprising, and, and as long as the radical left keeps pushing the way they keep pushing, then the alt-right is going to continue to grow. Although it's very, also very difficult to tell at, at now to what degree, to how large the movement is, or how serious it is, or any of those things at the moment. So, so just to bring you back to uh, cultural appropriation, is it possible that that plus about half a dozen other similar things that have appeared in the last 10 years rather than be kind of like an empty or, or ridiculous uh, baseless philosophy are in fact tactical, tactical constructs by postmodernist and, and Marxist think tanks, the evidence for that would be in the fact that they are always selectively enforced in a way which is the most destructive possible to our current system. Okay, so, so that's a, that, that kind of opens the broader question of, of conspiratorial action among political groups, let's say. So here's a way of thinking about it, I, and I, th I think this works. So, in any coherent philosophy, there's an impetus to action. That's partly what makes the philosophy coherent, and postmodernism is a coherent philosophy. It has an impetus to action. Now, it's very difficult to describe the entire structure of postmodernism, because it's fuzzy at the edges, it bleeds into other things. But imagine that there's a, there's a core of, uh, there's a core of central concerns. Now imagine that most people who are nominally postmodernists only understand fragments of that core concern. And so, if you take the typical indoctrinated social justice warrior, third year women's studies student, you might say, well, she's only 15% postmodernist.